Get ready, folks. Amen. Well, first of all, let's pray. Because if he don't come, we are in trouble. All you'll get is my dry joke. <laughs> Father, first of all, thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. But Father, we need our ears anointed. We need our hearts anointed to understand. And Father, I need you to come and help me string the right sentences together the right way. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, come, come. As we talk about your presence, would you come? Yes, Lord. Meet us deep inside. Father, thank you. Thank you. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. Before I forget, I am thankful for those folks that are here, and we greet the ones online. Are you having trouble hearing me? No. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Um, so, let me pull that. It's overbalanced. It's like me, it's unbalanced. <laughs> there we go. Can you hear me now? All right. I will try my best to speak up. And if I can't speak up, I won't speak down. All right. So, last week we talked about the presence of God going into captivity. And some of us begin to hear God speak that in us his presence is in captivity. God sent his presence. God sent his presence. The Philistines thought they captured it. The Israelites thought the Philistines captured, captured it. But God said, I sent my presence. So maybe we need to see God's perception of different things. And it may not be our perception. In fact, I would almost say it's never our first perception. Okay? He must teach us his ways. We do not want to be people of the signs and wonders and the acts of God. We want to be people of the ways of God. Amen. And that brings us into a whole new company, but we haven't got time to go there. <laughs> so let's look at the presence returns to the nation, but not to the center of worship. That is very significant because God is getting ready to bring his presence back to his church. And it's going to come back progressively. Yes. Because he's got to get us to a place where we will properly steward it. Amen. So let's review. God had sent his strength and glory, the Ark of the Covenant, into captivity. Psalm 78, 61, and he and delivered his strength. He delivered his strength into captivity, and he delivered his glory into the enemy's hands. <coughs> he did it. It's all his fault. <laughs> Why? Because Israel needed a lesson, and the Philistines needed a lesson. How I many know God never wastes anything? Amen, amen. When he flips the coin, he uses both sides. Some of you, God's flipping the coin in your life and you're not sure. You're in a spin. Cheer up, little lamb. <laughs> his manifest presence, which the ark represents, is his strength. The strength of any assembly is not their skills, but the level of the presence of God. That's the strength of any assembly. That is your personal strength. The level of the presence of God in your life. His manifest presence is his glory which dwelt between the cherubim above the mercy seat. The glory of God is his mercy. Let me say that again. The glory of God is his mercy. And if I want to move in glory, I need God to reveal to me 
what the mercy of God is all about. Okay? The Philistines, I love this name for them, and you know I do because I use it often. The Philistines, the wallowers in self. By the way, that's the meaning of the name. I think some of us may have some Philistines living within, and we need to dispossess them. Come on now. Amen. The wallowers themselves saw God's power manifest over their God of fertility, Dagon, and over the ravagers at Ashdod, over the power of the wrath at Gath, and over the extermination at Ekron. God has power over all of those things. But that's what the Philistines do. That's what wallowing in self or self-pity does to you. The longer you stay in it, the greater the problem. Now besides all this, the men had hemorrhoids. Okay? In other words, God got them in the end. All right. <laughs> besides all this, the men got hemorrhoids and the crops were ravaged by mice. Remember, you're dealing with a fertility God. And they felt that Dagon was the one that gave them good crops. So God had to give a personal discipline and a national discipline. This, they knew this was the work of God, but listen to this, but refused to submit to the presence, but consulted how to send it away. Dare I even go down that road? There are those today that are sending the presence away. Churches and individuals. Listen, God doesn't just visit churches. God visits individuals. But there are times when the individual feels God's presence is in their way. And God is saying, I'm coming. Get ready, get ready, get ready. I borrowed that from T.D. James. <laughs> in 1 Samuel 6, 1 and 2, and the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priest and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to its place. Wow. In saying that, they were saying its place is not with us. Seven is the number of perfection and one of the numbers of completeness. God had dealt with the Philistines, a type of the flesh, for a complete cycle, dealing, showing his complete power over all that they worshipped. Before God is done, before Jesus comes, there is going to be a clear manifestation of the power of the presence of God over all flesh. Jesus made a statement. Move this a little closer. I'll get a kink somewhere. All right. Jesus made a statement that one day, I won't tell you an experience I had. I was dealing online with a witch in New Zealand. And the pastor, I was talking to him, and, and the Lord said, I have power over all flesh, John 17, 1, right? Yeah. He said, rebuke her flesh. I said, oh God, never done that before. Sometimes God will ask you to do things that you think are outside of the box. Amen. Right. Why? Because he doesn't want you in a coffin either. I mean, a box either. <laughs> okay? And so, I thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. I'm typing. I'm not even talking to, to anyone. I'm typing. Back in the days when technology wasn't as good as it is today. I typed in and rebuked the flesh. And the pastor came on and typed, what in the world did you do? I said, why? He said, she just flew seven or ten feet back and hit the wall on the other side of the room. 
I said, okay, God, what do I do now? <laughs> See, the thing is, if we obey, he responds. And if you honestly look at the word, there are times when the men of God throughout Scripture, which wasn't written in some of it, did things that were outside of anyone's understanding of what God was like. God is not finished revealing who He is. <coughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Get ready. Because if what I feel for this city is going to come, you're going to have to have your spiritual seatbelts fastened. Because we're not just running a fast car, we're flying. Okay? They decided to send it, send it to his place rather than acknowledge God and submit to him. And re they rejected the presence. Some of us have been through a lot of good churches. Why do we leave? Because the presence was no longer there. So they had a plan of appeasement. The priests and diviners of the Philistines came up with a plan that they hoped would appease God for sending the Ark of the Presence back to Israel. Note these two different types of ministry that wallowers and self have to help them relate to their God Dagon. Priests, by definition, represent a man who is God. They would most likely be possessed. They were hearing from the priests, not necessarily the people. Because remember this, all the nations on the land were types and shadows of flesh problems. They were not demonic. They worshipped demons, but they were not demonic. We tried to cast some of those things out, and guess what? They didn't go. And the enemy tried to, con tried to convince us that God was powerless. But we were trying to cast out something that had to be driven out. And that I had to make a choice to get rid of. Come on. Amen. I haven't got time to go into the names of all seven nations on the land. But all of them are a type and shadow of areas of the flesh. One is the Amorite, which actually means I'm all right. So if you come up to something and say, I'm all right, check it out. All right. The diviners move in some level of witchcraft. Now listen to this. Because we we want to, to know something about these Philistines that we're fighting, okay? That are trying to oppress us. In whose hand the Ark of the Presence at this current time was taken into captivity. So they would definitely move in witchcraft of the flesh. And remember, Galatians 5, 10, 20 says there's witchcraft in the flesh. That is not demonic witchcraft. That is manipulation and control. And it includes these manipulative tools. Sarcasm. It's a manipulative tool. Innuendos. Intimidation. See, God does not never force us. Okay, he never forces. So if I'm feeling pressured, I need to ask God where it's coming from. It could be coming from within. It could be coming from without. The within might come from traditions I've been taught. Okay? Suggestion, put down, innuendo, guilt, shaming, and criticism. I'll never forget when God revealed this to me. I was writing a course from the scripture on the anatomy of the soul of man without using any psychological books at all. How many know I got a revelation? Yeah. God said if you use any of these, you're moving in witchcraft to the flesh. Okay. Let me know I had to clean up my act. 
when my mom and I were living together, my brother had gone back to my grandfather's, my mom and I would spend a whole evening being sarcastic with one another <laughs> and enjoy it. One day the Lord said, stop it. Of course I said, why? He said, because it's witchcraft. The witchcraft of the flesh. Too often we attribute things to the devil yes. that are flesh. Yes. And therefore we get no answers to our problem. That's right. And the enemy says, see, you can't cast it out, you have no power. No, that's not the issue, folks. I've got to discern between flesh and spirit. I've got to discern between spirit and soul. That discernment is a spiritual activity, not a natural one. It's not a deductive reasoning. I'll never forget when God first began to teach me discernment. I was in my first church. And we had an aisle down the middle packed. It would be 60 people. And I walked into the, to the uh, elders um, who was running the church at the time walked into his place and he said, we can't afford a pastor. Well, they made sure they couldn't because they never paid us but once or twice. And God had the sinners supply our needs. You know, God's going to get, if God wants you there, he's going to make sure he keeps you there. Okay? So, we knew that God wanted us there because the heart of the city said, let me stop. We were giving a ride home from the elder's place. And she said, let me stop at my house. So she was giving us a ride. Let me stop at She stopped. She got steak. She got vegetables. She got meat and everything and gave it to us. Why? Because God wanted us there. Okay? So we need to stop all of the witchcraft of the flesh and say, God, teach me how to walk totally in the realm of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. They heard and believed the accounts they would heard of Israel's history with Egypt. 1 Samuel 6 and 6. Wherefore then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened theirs? They weren't there. They heard stories of how many years ago? This was at the end of the time of the judges. They would heard the stories, they believed them. That's important. Why? Because even though they heard it, and they believed it, they didn't want God. See, sometimes we read these, and because we were told they were Bible stories, we take a story approach, rather than a historical approach. Okay. When he wrought the wonderful, <clears throat> wrought, wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? Knowing all these things, they still clung to their gods. They knew that to not send or take the ark back would have been hardening their hearts. It was their priests and diviners that gave them the warning. It wasn't some little old buddy. It wasn't even a prophet. Hello. Sometimes the world is more prophetic than we are. <laughs> Come on. Well, God can speak to an ass. He can use anyone. All right. <laughs> it was the priests and diviners that gave them the warning that if they did not send it back, worse things than the current plagues would happen. We need to see that this was a visitation of God among the Philistines. And I believe that God was calling them to himself. He was manifesting a dimension of power that had not been seen since Egypt. Because they worshipped the God they had to appease, they thought in those terms. They thought in terms of appeasement. 
How do we appease the God of Israel so we can see the flags lifted and go back to normal? Oh God, don't let the church go back to normal. Amen. They also worshiped the visible, so they felt they needed to produce some type of works of their hands as a gift to God. Of course, we never do that. One of our first responses when asked about something is, what do I do? This, always, this is always indicative of the flesh reacting. It's a do theology, a do-do theology, and all it produces is do-do. <laughs> the artisans made images of those things that plague them. Their personal plague, the emeralds, which is the biblical word, and the real experience is emeralds. If you've ever had them, you know those guys were in trouble. <laughs> the plague on the crops showed power over their god of fertility, and God was destroying their economy. Because their crops were their economy. Have you ever thought for a moment, and this is just an aside because I like to make us think, did you ever think that possibly the blind beggar lost his economy when Jesus opened his eyes? Yeah. Healing does not always make things better. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Sometimes God, in order to get you where he wants you, will do something that's a miracle, but it will take something else away. Why? God wants you to walk with him more than you do. And it's the mercy of God sometimes that takes away the first in order to establish the second. We don't like that takes away the first thing. We always think of that as sin and all that stuff. No. If you're going from the outer court into the holy place, God will remove some outer court stuff so you can go into the next realm. And if you're in the holy place and God's calling you into the holiest of all, he will remove some holy place stuff. Won't let it work anymore. And someone will accuse you of having backslid. I've been there. I've been accused by the best. And I'm still here in spite of the church. I mean, I'm still here. <laughs> they suggested that they place the ark on a cart to be hauled by cows. It would come to your question, sir. With young calves. If the cows went to Israel and left their calves, then they would know that the plagues were sent from the God of Israel. The only other option they knew that caused the plagues was they came by chance. They are putting a fleece before God. Right? Isn't that a fleece? Yeah. If this happens, then we'll know. Okay. They saw the plagues as a great evil, not as punishment, or God endeavoring to convince them of his power and the fallacy of the worship of the day God. I'm not sure we know the level of the power that was of God that was active. And yet they, they didn't look at it as punishment. They didn't look at it as, as the power of God wanting to draw them into the worship of God. They looked at it as a great evil. How often do we look at God's discipline as evil? These are hard questions. But we need to begin to pray and say, God, I want to know your ways. I do not want to assume that something has come my way. I want to know why. I want to know the whys of God. It says the children of Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew his ways. And you know, I read in Revelation 11 that the two witnesses are coming back. Now, I believe that they may well be the literal, Moses and Elijah. But I also believe there's a company of those two in the church. And there's going to rise up a company of people in the church of God that know the ways of God. 
that understand why God does things and are able to become what Job calls an interpreter. It would, nobody spoke in tongues in Job's day, so it had to be something else, didn't it? If there be an interpreter, Job 33, if there be an interpreter with him, one among a thousand, to show unto man God's uprightness. What does an interpreter do? He shows you in your dealings with God, God's uprightness. Why God is doing something. Oh, hallelujah. How often do we assume that something happened to us is evil without consulting God as to its source, origin, or reason for being in our lives? We say, it's an attack of the enemy. And it might be. It might be. But we assume and don't ask God for further explanation. Therefore, we don't know the way of God in what we're going through. We say it's an attack of the enemy. It's not, it is not that there may not be an attack. The fallacy is we assume and do not ask God why. Amen. See, everything God allows in your life is to press you into Him. That's how much He wants relationship with you. Now, the milk cows looking for a sign. Hmm. They suggested that they place the ark on a cup. A cup. Yeah, we did that. Okay, I'll have to come back and work with that. Later. The milk cows walked away from their calves, leaving the Philistines to grapple with God's power. Just because they walked away didn't mean God was not trying to get their attention. And sometimes just because people walk away from God doesn't mean he's not going to continue to try and get their attention. It's obvious that the Philistines followed a distance behind to watch this sign. They followed the sign, but it did not change their lifestyle or who they worshipped. Now, catch this, because this is a point that is sore needed to hear in the church today. Many today follow the signs and wonders of God, but it does not change their lives. It does not cause them to repent and turn to God. They remain the way they were, or at least in the land of the Philistines. God sends signs and wonders. God allows signs and wonders. But again, it's to cause us to press into God not to just enjoy the sign and wonder. God is up to change you. Yes. He accepted you as you is, but He wants to move you to as He is. Amen. So, you know, He's the God who is, who was, and who is to come. I cannot know the was until I know the is. Then he will teach me is to come. And too often we want to know the is to come before we know anything else. Time to get out of that realm. So many are caught up with end time stuff that they don't let God change them. Amen. God's out to change you. Get ready. It's not that he doesn't love you as you is, but he wants to love you so much that you and him is the same. Hallelujah. God's purpose for signs and wonders is that we might press into knowing him. In Deuteronomy 13, 1, 1 to 3, and consider this, because see... There's so much going for the prophetic today. There's so much going of signs and wonders today. And yet there's something missing in the church with all of that going on. You know what's missing? The character and nature of Jesus. That's right. That's the bottom line. Okay. 
So in Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 3, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign and a wonder, what's that telling you? That's going to happen. Signs and wonders are going to happen. People follow the signs. Don't, no, don't go there. And the sign or wonder come to pass. Oh boy. Must be a real prophet. Look, it came to pass. Whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let's go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Some of the things we go through are to prove us. God doesn't need to know. When God came down and walked in the cool of the day and said, Adam, where art thou? It wasn't because he'd lost Adam. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it was because Adam needed to know where Adam was. That's right. Hello. Sometimes God asks a question not because he don't know the answer, but because you need to have an answer come out of your heart and reveal your heart. Amen. Okay? Well, whether it's okay or not, it's true. All right. <laughs> Amen. If God allows this to happen, he's testing you or proving your discernment. You can't have your discernment proved if he doesn't test it. How many love the test? Ouch. Nobody. How many love the results when you get a grade A? Yeah. <laughs> All right. This scripture indicates that there will be lying signs and wonders that false prophets will do. He declares that the motive behind it needs to be known before you accept the sign or the wonder. Amen. What does that mean? I have to be in close relationship with the Lord. It also indicates that the signs and wonders can be dangerous. You know there are people that worship signs and wonders? Yes. There are people that worship the prophetic mm -hmm. and it makes it much more difficult for people to receive. Is that a good prophet or not? Well, as the prophet like unto Moses. Isn't that what Jesus was? He was the prophet like unto Moses. And the Bible says that him will you hear. There's going to be a hearing people when that is manifest. I want to be among the hearing people. Amen. 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 Learn to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. From 1 John 4 and 1. These will do signs and wonders. Try the spirit behind it. If they get upset because you don't believe, it's a wrong spirit. Come on now. Amen. Their focus is still phil philistinial. Is that a word? All right. It is now. Arriving in Israel. The Philistines put the ark on a cart, although it was not the prescribed way by God. It was allowed by God because none of them were Levites, consecrated to minister unto the Lord and to carry the ark. And by the way, the ark's work in Philistia was done. God will allow some things in transition. I said, God will allow some things to happen in transition. He will anoint some things that when he gets it in order, it will no longer be anointed. Don't get caught up with what he anoints to be done in transition. The very fact that it's transition means it's not going to stick around very long. The church is in transition. I is in transition. Pray for a house. I need one. All right. <laughs> We're looking. All right. 
Later, David assumes it's okay to carry the ark on a cart, and death is the result for one who touches the ark. Let me say this. Too often, we just leave that there. But every time I touch the presence, without permission, some death happens. See, we're spiritual people. All these things are prophetic of end time stuff. It says all these things happen to them for examples to us. That's the way we read, we read it. But there's also all these things are examples of us. Does that make a difference? Yeah. That means I can be like them. I don't like to do that. I don't like to say that. I don't like to be that, so I say to us. But one of the translations says, all these things were examples of us on whom the ends of the age are come. Israel was the firstborn, right? right. And God is going to deal with the rest of his born the way he did with the firstborn. Hello? Oh boy. Okay? That's why we study the Old Testament to see how God dealt with Israel so we don't turn out the same as they did. Come on. My, it's quiet out there. <laughs> In 1 Chronicles 15, 13, when God has ordered something, you see the Philistines not only didn't have Levi, they didn't know the order. So God allowed some things, but when Israel had the writings and the instructions and didn't follow it, that put them in the line for judgment. So there's some things that God will, uh, you know, I, I think I told this story here, I may not have. How many have read the book, The Heavenly Man? Get it and read it. It just messes your theology. <laughs> I, I met him. Phenomenal man of God. But when he got, you know, his, his dad was dying of cancer. They gave him two weeks to live. And his mom, before Miao Tung took over, had, had uh, been a servant to a Christian elder. And she remembered that the elder had said, if you pray in Jesus' name, he'll heal. So she gathered the family around the bed, and she said, Jesus, the elder said, if I pray in your name, you will heal. Isn't that a good theological prayer? <laughs> Guess what? The next morning he woke up. He hadn't eaten in three weeks. He wanted breakfast. Amen. He got out of bed. He walked. Guess what? The whole family got saved. But they had no theology. So they prayed in Jesus' name because that worked. And they talked about the holy dragon who would heal. Their theology was a mess. But God honored their theology because it was by faith. He straightened out their theology later. We get so hung up on doctrine. You know, my doctrine's built on nothing less than Schofield's notes and scripture press. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but check it out with Thompson Chain. On dates annotated, now I stand. All other doctrines sinking sand. All other doctrines sinking sand. Oh my gosh, that's so I think that's an old hymn of the church. All right, anyway. But Israel knew the order. David assumed he could do what the Philistines did. The Philistines had no revelation, but Israel did. And David had access to all the scrolls. So, because he did it not after the due order, death resulted. Thank God it was only one people. We'll find out here in a minute that there was some other death that happened. 
Okay. There's much teaching in that phrase. The incident helps define a spiritual breach as well. Because in David, it said there was a breach. And the breach was not obeying. That opens the door to death. Okay? There are times when God will allow something as an exception, but don't make the exception the rule. The ark returned at harvest time. Underscore this. The manifest presence of God is returning at harvest time. We are coming into harvest time, folks. The presence of God is going to return to the church. Amen. It was leading up to the Feast of Pentecost, wheat harvest. Now all the harvests, or all the feasts, are harvest feasts. You know how I know we haven't had a full Passover yet? There hasn't been a harvest. Now I know that Pentecost has not been fully restored. They can only be celebrated when we come into the promises of God. They couldn't be celebrated in Egypt. They couldn't be celebrated in the wilderness. They could only be celebrated when the church comes into the promises of God. When it's time to cross the Jordan. When it's time for God to roll everything back all the way to Adam. Come on now. You don't say amen, I will. Amen. <laughs> I get excited in case you hadn't guessed. <laughs> Passover is barley harvest. Bar barley was the food of the poor. Pentecost was the culmination of the wheat harvest. By the way, the bride Ruth was prepared through gleaning in both of these harvests. The bride cannot be formed until we come to harvest time. Come on now. We need to get some of this stuff way down deep inside and realize what time we're living in. We are living in a time that's unprecedented in the plan of God. Amen. Unprecedented. And that means some things are going to happen. They're going to blow us out of the water and blow our minds. Amen. We're going to see miracles such as never been seen since creation. Because Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do. Anybody ever go through and study the miracles in the Gospels? And then study the miracles in the book of Acts? There's no greater miracle than done yet. Let that sink in. <laughs> All right. The Feast of Pentecost was the culmination of the wheat harvest, the grain of the more affluent. The Feast of Tabernacles was the culmination of all the other feasts or all the other harvests like fruit, vegetables, nuts. That's where I come in. Nuts and olives and grapes. We're coming to the most important harvest. We celebrated a type and shadow of it in the fall. But the most important harvest is the fruit harvest. And you can't hurry the growth of fruit. I don't have time to go into that, but just note that on the sideline. First Samuel 6.13 And they of Bethshemesh Beth were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. In 1 Samuel 6, 19, And he smote the men of Bathshemesh, Bathshemesh because they looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote the people. Now, see, these are people who understand, who have the scrolls. Those who know have greater responsibility than those who don't know. Okay. He even smoked 50,000 three score and ten men. And the people lamented because God had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. 
Now, they were right to rejoice at the return of the ark. They were right to offer the sacrifice to the Lord, but they did not respect the presence and looked into the ark when they knew better. This brought the judgment of God upon those present when it happened. We're coming to a day of, an accountabil of accountability. Okay? God is coming in awesome power, awesome presence to numerous places around the country. He's going to visit the Israel of God in an unprecedented way in the days to come. You can take that to the bank. The question is, will we be one of those places? Individually and corporately. Not only is the presence returning, but God wants to train his people to respect and steward his presence. He wants to train some spiritual Levites who will teach God's people the proper treatment and reverence for the presence. Now there's a worldly saying that is some merit. Familiarity breeds contempt. And I've observed in over 60 years around the things of the Spirit, a danger. When God moves consistently for an extended period of time in meetings with a people, they tend to begin to think they've done something to deserve it. They think they've prayed it down. Now, or it's because of the way we worship. Or... It's our adherence to right teaching. Or, it's our defense of the gospel. A true visitation of the manifest presence, they are because of his mercy. That should be my attitude to a visitation of the manifest presence. God, it's your mercy that I'm not consumed. Because in this instant, 50,000 were consumed. Now, folks, sometimes we get so caught up in the things that bring joy and the exciting things of God, but it's time we begin to respect God. Amen. It's time the fear of the Lord returned to the church. That's not fear he's going to strike me. It's a loving him so much I don't want to grieve his heart. Yes, that's right. true fear of the Lord. Amen. And God, by the way, that's an anointing. From Isaiah 11 and 2. It's one of the anointings. And listen, listen carefully. Put this seed in your seed bag. In order to come into what God has, every one of those anointings is going to have to be active in the end time people. I can't do it without the anointing. The anointing destroys any yoke in me, not breaks it. Don't go there. That's a wrong translation. The anointing destroys the yoke. What does that mean? It means nobody can put it back together. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. <laughs> when the presence comes, give it room. I've entitled this slide, How to Respect the Presence. Give time to hear what he wants to do and for him to do it. Often we try and control the presence and channel it to do what we think we need. We use it for healing, deliverance, prophetic, and other aspects of ministry. And all those are valid uses of the presence. But what does he want? Why did he come? And he, you know, if we find out the reason why I come, all those other things will happen. But too often we let him do, we, we subject him to what we want and then never find out what he came for. Oh, I wish we could do that. I really do. Sometimes he wants us to sit in his presence and allow our spirits to marinate as he infuses us with his spirit and life. His spirit first, and comes to impart spirit. He is spirit first. 
and comes to impart to us through whatever or whoever he uses. Impartation is more important than information. Amen. Your impartation will take you into eternity. Your information might take you someplace else. In Isaiah 40, in verse 31, but they that what? Wait. Wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Oh, but I have to wait while it's renewed. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. By the way, the mounting up is our record. The running is holy place, and the walking is is the holiest of all. In Luke 19, 13, and he called his ten servants and delivered unto them ten pounds and said, Occupy till I come. I want to give you a little different application of that scripture. Because we keep it within the, the, the parable. But it's a principle of God. It's right to occupy till he comes. It's right to do what God set before us. It's right to minister. It's right to, to worship. It's, it's right to heal the sick, raise the dead, and cast out devils till he comes. But when his presence comes, give him room. When his presence comes, give him room. Don't make it serve your purpose. I wish you could hear that way down deep inside. Wish you could hear his heart in that cry. Don't use it as an advertising gimmick. Learn to allow him to lead his service, especially when his manifest presence comes. There's nothing wrong with an order of service as long as it's subject to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whenever I'm in charge, I come with a message. But I tell the Holy Spirit, you're welcome to change it if you want. Amen. And sometimes I get to church and I have to put the message in, not in file 13, because usually God has me studying something because it's going to be used later. Too often we, we put away what we had and never pick it up again. Listen, God never causes you to study but what he's got a purpose. Amen. If nothing else, to do a work in you. And you need work. No, I mean that. <laughs> in Isaiah 49 and 23, And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they that they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. I remember we had a prophetess come and spend some time. Well, the last 27 years of her life was with, it, with our ministry in Canada and here in the States when we came across. And early in her time coming to be with us, we were meeting in the schoolhouse room. There were about 70 there. And the presence of God came and we sat. And nobody said anything. Nobody worshipped. Nothing. We just sat and waited. And she said, after two minutes, I begin to get antsy. She said, that after four minutes, I was really, really agitated and sat. And I think it was about 10 minutes we waited and then God came through. So after we were discussing it, because she wanted to know what was going on. She'd never heard or seen anything like this before. She said, what in the world? Why did you wait so long? I said, well, did God show up? Yeah, he did. But it was 10 minutes. <laughs> I said, did God do something? Oh, yes. Then I took it to the scripture. They that wait for me shall never 
be ashamed. Folks, sometimes it takes discipline to wait. And especially in our microwave age. Right? That's right. We don't want to take an hour to cook the potatoes. Put them in the nuker. Come on. Amen. And we take that approach to the things of God. Oh. Consider the work done through waiting. This is, uh, this is just some. But we, we, we want to get this into your spirit. Okay? Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 37, 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Proverbs 20, verse 22. Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. I've drawn principles from this. The heart is strengthened through waiting on God. I would ask you this. If you don't wait, will you be strengthened? He exalts you to a place and gives substance of inheriting as you wait in his presence. He takes you into dimensions or levels of being saved while you're waiting on him. 2 Corinthians 1 and 10 says, I was delivered. It says, yeah, who delivered you, who doth deliver, and will yet deliver. The word deliver there can also be translated save. He saved me. He is saving me, present progressive tense, and he's going to bring me to full and complete salvation. Why? Because I wait. These are works done in your spirit. I want to emphasize that. These are works done in your spirit as you wait in his presence. They are invisibles that minister to the spirit man. The call on our lives is a call to be carriers of the manifest presence of God, like Peter and Paul. Did. They came into that because they respected the presence and spent time in it. Learning to wait on the Lord is part of that spending time. Jesus said, let your light so shine. By the way, um, anybody hear the lights talk today? <laughs> you mean they didn't say anything? I know. <laughs> Are you hearing me? Too often we have to talk. He didn't say do witnessing. He said be something. And your light, and I've never heard a light talk. I remember teaching, the one time I taught at uh, Morningstar, I went out and bought a battery operated light. And I passed it around among the men. It was a men's meeting. Passed it around among the men and said, listen to this. <laughs> and of course they said, I can't hear anything. I said, that's the object of the lesson. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. All of that is visible, not audible. Now, do I believe in witnessing? Absolutely. But it's time that we brighten up. <laughs> it's time we begin to light or be a visible expression of what we're talking about. The ability to manifest the presence in such a way that people only see Jesus is clearly stated here as a possibility. People still have to say that was Jesus. They still have to, you know, someone's healed, well, and people thank them for the healing. No, no. It says they shall see your good works and they won't even see you. They'll glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That's my cry. Amen. God, bring me to that place. Yes, in 1 Samuel 6 and 20, in the myth of men of Bathsheba said, Who's able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up for us? And they sent messengers to the inhabitants of 
Kurdish Jurim, saying, The Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. The incident released the fear of the Lord back into the nation. They decided to have the ark removed to another place. They are, we are not told whether they recognize their error in looking into the ark or not. Just let's get rid of this presence. It's too dangerous. You know, I've heard people say that about the presence of God. Grieve my heart. Grieve my heart. There were Levites at, at, at now. This is a progressive moving towards due order. When God brings his presence back, it will be the beginning of a journey towards due order. It's not going to come all at once. I wish it would, but I'm not sure we would steward it properly if it did. God is a God of mercy and of grace, and he's going to do it at the speed of people can handle it. But listen... Let me warn you again, the presence is coming to CMC. Amen. He has promised me that, and he's promised Ellie that. That's why you're getting us. Because we've got a promise. Amen. Hallelujah. First Samuel 7 and 1. And the men of Kirchus Jerem came and fetched up the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab in the hill and sanctified Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. Note that immediately they sanctified and consecrated a Levite whose only purpose was to tend to and keep the ark of the presence. It's not enough to be a Levite in the house. But there needed to be a specific someone, because it was a house of Levites. There needed to be a specific someone to attend to it. We're not told all that was included, but that became his focus for 20 years. That it was there. I want to look at some things here. The ark was sent into captivity by God near the beginning of Samuel's time as a judge. That means it was no longer the center of Israel's worship. I think we have to come to grips with the presence is not the center of worship yet. The ark was in captivity for seven months. The ark came back to Israel at harvest time, the feast of Pentecost time. God is going to pour out his presence as it returns in an unprecedented way to his chosen people, both Jew and Gentile, or to his whole church, the holy nation. It's going to happen. Amen. Am I going to be in on it? That's the question. Am I going to facilitate it by being a carrier of the presence? In Bible school 53 years ago, Dr. Ed was in our class as well, we had this young lady from Jamaica, and she said this. She said, if I get on fire, and you get on fire, and we all get on fire, and we come together, we have a bonfire. Yep. Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. Get on fire. Amen. Get on. By the way, if you get on fire, you'll be a light anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, Note this in Joel 2.23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. He will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Pentecost plus. Not Azusa Street plus. Pentecost plus. Oh, by the way, it's coming as a rushing... Some people are going to get blown away. <laughs> the moderate rain is the outpourings of the Spirit or times of refreshing. And we get that from Acts 3.19. Times of refreshing shall come from where? The hand of the Lord. We need to see His hand. Okay. 
okay? The rain, the blessings of God. Now this is all coming in the end time, folks. It's coming. It's coming. The former rain, the same level that came at Pentecost. Now that was phenomenal. And talk about evangelism. How much evangelism did they need that first day? How many souls were saved? How many the next day? 5,000 were saved. You mean in two days you have 8,000 in the church? We had to make a church without trying. <laughs> Are we ready? Are we ready? If God just sent what he sent at Pentecost, are we ready? There were 120 stewards for 8,000 church. Two days. And then, after that, the Lord added daily to the church, such as should be saved. And we're not told how many they were, but they say by the time Titus brought down Jerusalem, there were over 50,000 in the church in Jerusalem. That's a mega church no matter how you cut it, folks. Amen. So stop railing against the mega church. Just pray revival into it. Yes. Amen. We are going to see mega churches in the end time. But they will be caused by the awesome presence of a living God. Amen. The latter rain is seven times the intensity and power of Pentecost. We're not even ready for Pentecost. <laughs> the same month, in quick succession, or perhaps, perhaps the same generation. It's coming. He's promised. By the way, he's never been known to lie with his promises yet. No, we Hallelujah. The fear of the Lord will return to the church. Worshippers to attend the presence will be set apart by God to minister unto the Lord. Not to the people, but to the Lord. Because when you minister unto the Lord, as they did in Acts 13, the Lord said, in other words, it released a prophetic word that changed the dimension of the church. Maintaining and ministering to the presence will be their total focus. A worshiper is one who moves in the creative power of God. Remember this. Psalm 22, 3. But thou art holy, O thou that, what? Inhabitest the praises of Israel. By worship, creating the presence. Creating the atmosphere where he loves to come. Israel moved in a form of godliness for over a hundred years. The ark was not in the holiest of all or the center of Israel's worship. Samuel, 20 years. Then Saul, 40 years. Then David, 40 years. And then Solomon, 7 years building the temple. Or it took 7 years to get the context ready. To return the presence to the center. It's going to take time to get ready for what God's going to do. This is important truth because in 90% of the church today, the manifest presence is not the center of worship. It isn't that there isn't some level of the presence, but it's not the center. And we get fooled by a level of the presence when he wants it to be the center. Yes. Amen. Okay? There are odes or songs of thanksgiving. There are testimony songs. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. Testimony songs. And they're good, but they're not praise. They're to get us, get our minds focused, but we should enter his gates with thanksgiving. And his courts praise. with praise. But not a lot of Jesus being lifted up. See, worship focuses on he who is the presence of God. 
Now this is the reason that the presence is not strong in many spirit-oriented churches. Because Jesus is not the focus of worship. If you worship him, he will come. Israel would have to wait until David came to the throne over 67 years after the ark came back to the land in order for the ark to have a place of honor. God is calling a people to return the presence to the center of their lives. At the very least, find their own Curtis Jerem and their own house of Abinadab. The only thing Curtis Jerem is famous for is housing the ark for 20 years. I looked wherever I could find Curtis Jerem in the Bible, the only reference is the presence. The presence. We want to be known for the presence. Yes, yes, yes. Let us journey to Curtis Jerem in the spirit. Let us enter into the house of Abinadab, the father of generosity, a generous place, and give, pray, give worship and praise unto the Lord, thereby creating a place for his presence to rest. Can we pray? Yes. Lord, our hearts are full. We want to be a participant in that company of people who maintain the manifest presence regardless of the strength, the state of the rest of the holy nation. Show us how to maintain the presence with the right attitude of worship and humility. We need you to draw us into deeper or deeper into your heart so that we worship in such a way as it pleases your heart and causes you to want to inhabit our graves. We invite you to come. We worship you because you want us to become your dwelling place. Lord, please come. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence. Amen. Do not do it in Deacon's second moment.